I am Nathaniel Whittemore, host of the Breakdown Podcast, and I am here today with Ron Resnick, the president of the Interwork Alliance, and Sergey Nazarov, the co-founder of Chainlink. Ron, I'd love to hear a little bit about how IWA came to be, what you guys do, and where your sense of uh, enterprise adoption of blockchain is, right? Like, I guess do a little bit of level setting for our audience about where in the cycle we are and what IWA's part of this is. Uh, it's a great question. And, um, so many businesses recognize the importance to implement better solutions to meet the global market requirements. And this is like a mega evolving business climate. I don't think anybody really knows how it's going to play out. But uh, one thing is for certain, uh, companies are recognizing, not all of them, it's got still, and yes, about the adoption si- side, I think we're just in the early stages of this. Uh, companies are recognizing key barriers to improve this whole notion of multi-party business processes and interoperability amongst disparate business infrastructure. Um, And also the the business model of how that's going to play out. I've been in certain meetings where now uh, I heard the term, which is great, split the check, uh, which means that uh, companies and uh, currently always thought about creating a Let's say a con- I'm a biz dev guy. Uh, we, we, we put together a deal on a contract between two parties, and, uh, and it doesn't include necessarily the competition or even other players in other parts of the world. But what I'm experiencing, and when you asked about the adoption side, I'm experiencing certain companies who have champions within their, their own structure, and I'm speaking most likely in bigger companies here, where they're starting to recognize that, you know what? The, the world is changing. We need to really come up with a way, and that's where decentralization comes in, to um, conduct business in a much more efficient way. And uh, the, the approach that best addresses these challenges um, are based on a digitizing the real world assets of value. And so we, those are tokens. So we're not about tokens for speculative currency. We're about a token, tokenizing real world assets. And basically those use cases have been around for hundreds and hundreds or thousands of years. But now we have an opportunity to, uh, to make them work solely in the, in the digital world. The problem is that most of the, to- the token implementations today are fragmented. And the other problem is their technology, uh, technology bias. Uh, so that's why we formed the uh, IWA. It's, uh, I believe it's the, the next step. Um, our vision is to simplify the world of a token-powered digital interchange, which means the exchange of value and how those contracts and, um, and what's associated tied to that value gets uh, uh, the business get, gets commercialized. So in order to do that, our job is we, we work to empower org- organizations to adopt and use these token-powered distributed services in their day-to-day business operations. Sergey, let's talk a little bit about the problem set that you're working on with, uh, with Chainlink. Sure. So we work on something called Oracles, which uh, seeks to essentially create a blockchain abstraction layer between all these different systems that want to control smart contracts and and all the things that those smart contracts do. So oracles are kind of middleware and they act as glue to enable the adoption of all of these smart contract and tokenized, tokenized contract systems by enterprises. So and enterprises are in, a, are in a unique situation these days because they have to choose between all kinds of technologies, public clouds, private clouds, different API frameworks, you know, 15 other different things. And now they also have to deal with blockchains and they're basically being told that they have all these different environments where they have to find a way um, to do commerce, right? They need, they need to do business in environment A in Asia and environment B in Europe and environment C in the US in all these different blockchain environments. And also they need to consume data from different sources into those smart contracts. Um, I, I, think, I think there's always an evolution and you've seen this in the public blockchain space. So you saw an initial evolution around tokenization, and those, those tokens then put a lot of value into the systems that then have people with private keys that put those tokens or spend those tokens into certain specific applications, right? So I, I think there is a certain evolution where you first do need some value, something, um, something that's controlled by a blockchain-based system, whether that's a smart contract that's controlling outcomes or whether that's a smart contract that's controlling tokens, right? We, we deal less with the tokens and more with the outcomes. So we deal more with the next stage of development, which I think, 
run and, and the IWA have, have some plans and ideas around as well is, is, is how, do we, how do we build an ecosystem of standards that people can use in order to conduct this commerce, right? And in this new environment, right? If, if, the, if, if we're saying that before people would use paper and then they use the internet and now they use blockchains to conduct these agreements, that's essentially what, what we're all saying in one form or another. The people that are doing all of this, they already have enterprise systems and they need those enterprise systems successfully connected into, um, into some blockchain or some framework. And that's the technology that we kind of built. And so we, we have a lot of users and we have a lot of uh, large enterprises that we work with. And we've accumulated a certain amount of insight and knowledge about, you know, how do people that have existing systems already managing billions of dollars, how do they want to interact with a smart contract? And I, I think standards are very important. And there's a lot that, you know, technology companies like ours from the experience that we have with, with actual users that are actually implementing smart contracts in these, in these interconnected ways, that, um, that there, there really needs to be a meeting between uh, technology providers and users on, on some kind of uh, very reasoned framework, right? And that, that framework can evolve in a, in a place like the Inner, Inner Work Alliance, then it can include technology such as Chainlink to be part of how people interact with all these contracts, whether they're about tokens or whether they're about um, some kind of event like a derivative. Uh, at, at the end of the day, you're still going to need glue. You're going to need middleware that's going to allow all the systems to use all of, um, all of those contracts, whether it's token contracts or other contracts. You're, you're, you're going to need something that allows people to go from their to go to, to keep using their current enterprise systems, but to use them to interact with blockchains. And and we at Chainlink, we have, I think, the widest amount of blockchain integrations out there. I think we have over 50 chains announced. We're integrated with um, all kinds of chains: Ethereum, Tezos, Polkadot, Hyperledger, a whole a whole bunch of different variations of these chains that we were in different stages of integration with, uh, in public and private forms. And the the capacity to to have people connected across different chains is, is one of the things that I think we bring, bring to the enterprise environment um, against the types of standards that the IWA would create, right? Is here's how a smart contract should work. Oh, it should, it should be connected to from your systems using this technology stack. Oh, there's chain link in the technology stack acting as a, as a bridge, as a way for your existing systems messages to interact with blockchains, to generate a blockchain event, and then the blockchain event to be reinterpreted back onto your enterprise systems as an enterprise event. And, and this would, would keep you from having to make 50 different blockchain teams for the 50 different blockchains where you want to conduct commerce. So I want to come back to, uh, to some details in a, in a minute, Sergey, and maybe get a few more specifics about how you've seen oracles used in specific enterprise implementations or the types of things that you're thinking about. But I actually want to come back, and this could be for both of you, but maybe we'll start with Ron, and kind of zoom out again for, uh, for helping people understand what are the types of value propositions that, uh, that these enterprises are most interested in when it comes to blockchain? What are they looking at now, especially now that we've got a few years under our belt of actually working with companies and figuring out what their real needs are? Um, so I guess what value propositions are they interested in? And then uh, kind of a follow-up to that, what are the pain points that they're experiencing in that? And to the extent that we, you know, you guys have previewed it a little bit, where do standards fit into solving those pain points? So like I said, Ron, maybe we'll start with you and then Sergey, you can fill in as well what, what you've seen with your experience. Okay, um, so I'll give you a, a little bit of a list of areas that um, are the value propositions that are driving all of this is number one, uh, speeding up the transactions. And actually, the latency of transactions, as you know, has been a, a big issue in trying to, to get it to work. Um, and so, which means that this is done without a middleman. So, trying to avoid having a middleman involved, where, uh, whereby they're can improving efficiency. Another aspect of this, which is huge, which is to protect the transaction data. So cryptographically secure um, transactions. And some of that is going to be done off the chain. Um, that's where oracles and other aspects uh, come into play. So how do, how do you have this into work? And that's what we're doing. Um, and, th and this whole notion of decentralization to reduce the large scale hacking of accounts, as well as scaling to, for uh, using third party sources 
to grow much faster than any company, even a large company, build out infrastructure. If that infrastructure is already out there, that is secure, decentralized, that, that speeds up their whole opportunity to conduct business. Another aspect of this, um, where uh, next year we're experiencing these pain points, there is very little trust by regulators to date. Uh, and the regulatory laws and, um, in each country are different. So a solution that we're putting together, for example, in the IWA, as long as you have the right uh, properties and behaviors for something to happen, the, uh, and you have them defined properly, regardless of where you are, whatever country or ge geo, the regulators still can use the same formulas and framework so that you can have this interworking globally. Another part, which is a huge pain point, is the cost of audits. So enterprise are being recognized that to scale, to, to reach this global population, that there are uh, concessions they need to make, and then there's new paradigms to consider. And I sort of mentioned already this notion of splitting the check. So they need, so, uh, they need to eliminate these con contracts uh, in a way that um, is causing, um, I'd say, uh, the, first of all, the, the benefits of having a blockchain or even a token model uh, can be obstructed because you have still manual paper uh, trails to engage with. So uh, that's a huge pain point that is being overcome. The folks are working to overcome them and using what we're talking about, our framework, uh, tied to solutions that are being implemented can, um, can solve. I'll give you an example. Uh, we're working with uh, two tokens in the UK who's working with uh, the Port of Rotterdam and uh, Port of Singapore. And they've come up with a way to, um, in maritime shipping, for electronic bills of lading, uh, to be transacted and managed uh, without any kind of paper trail. That makes sense. Sergey, what do you think? You know, and you can answer either side of the question, either one, what sort of value propositions you've seen enterprises be really interested in, or two, once they're in the room, what their challenges are. I mean, I can quickly just cover both in a quick, more general sense. G generally speaking, I think I'm seeing movement in securities and in insurance and some stuff in trade finance. I think the way to really review what the dynamics are is the complexity. So you, you really need a balance between the return and the complexity of implementing a blockchain. So if you implement the blockchain and you're only getting moderate gains and you have a lot of people you need to coordinate with, then the cost and the complexity is high. So the places where I'm seeing the, the biggest movement and the fastest movement is in the securities industry, where people have transactions not with 15 parties, but with like two or three parties. So you have some kind of issue where they sell something to one party and another party services the, the thing that they generated, whether that's an asset-backed security or whether it's some other financial product. And so th there you have a lot of benefits from blockchains because it's a golden record. You can, you can make efficiencies happen. You can have all these kind of positive dynamics. So the, the, the way that I generally look at it is, okay, somebody's showing up with a use case. All right, what are the benefits from the use case and, and how many parties need to be involved? If 15, 20 parties need to be involved, even if the benefits are moderately large, that's going to be a long, long story that, that's going to take time to evolve. If it's uh, something like what I see in the financial products markets where you have two or three people involved in a transaction, and that means only one or two or three people actually need to get going on a blockchain, commonly only even one party, and then they give interfaces to the other two parties, then things can move quicker. So it's, it's really a matter of, you know, what is the benefit to those parties and how many parties are there? The more parties, the more people need to get onboarded. And, and this goes to Ron's um, you know, kind of second point about what he's seeing as the issue, which is the same thing that we're seeing. There, there are these entities that are used to doing certain types of transactions. Those transactions are being reborn on a blockchain infrastructure on a case-by-case -case basis for specific benefits. You know, derivatives have one benefit, asset-backed securities, another benefit, some lending, some other benefits, indicated loans, another benefit. And it's, it's all very use case specific. But what they're basically doing is they're taking a category of commerce or you know, commercial activity that they're already doing, that they already have systems to control and to interact with and to display to their tens of thousands of people that are trained you know, how to properly interact with this type of transaction. And now they're, they're in a situation where they, they have to have the plumbing, the back end of that transaction being somewhere else, right? So they already have all of these people trained on all of these systems. They know that they wanna do the transaction. 
They know that the transaction is probably going to happen today on, on blockchain A and tomorrow on blockchain B and the day after on blockchain C, right? And, and they need a technology solution. Um, well, for, first, they need some common framework to understand how to make these financial products, right? And that's part of what standards will get a lot of people to, right? Is, is people will say, here's the right way to, to write um, a technologically enforced, data-driven smart contract. Right. Here's how we write that. Here's how we ex express our our interrelationship between each other as entities. And that has questions around the formatting of that, the language they use, uh, any other number of conditions that they need to put together between themselves. The, the next question that they're going to need to interact with is once we've figured out how do we interact with each other in a blockchain based format, right, in a smart contract record, um, how do we actually implement that? So how do we actually take the system that you have, which is some system run by one enterprise uh, software provider, and my system that's run by another enterprise software provider that we're basically locked into because they locked us in pretty well, right? They sold us all these interfaces and APIs, and we can't switch off because we have tens of thousands of people. That's, I think, what Ron was mentioning is when they have existing infrastructure. And then the question is, how do I, from that existing infrastructure, from all those existing systems, which have security wrapped around them and training and and you know for thousands and th literally thousands of people how do i how do i use those systems to now before i was doing some 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 kind of version of this transaction over the internet just a, the, just the vanilla internet and we were all keeping database records in each other's systems and you know things were taking longer now i have this shared record in this impartial third party sitting between us but how do i interact with that and it, and it's that um technical interaction that is the next hurdle. And, and even if people arrive at shared standards and shared understandings, which they need to arrive at, and even shared languages to, to express their um, contracts, they will then need to interact with those contracts from each of their respective systems. Um, and, and that's going to be the wall, and that's the hurdle that they're going to need to clear. So in, in that sense, I think it's a very logical collaboration between us and Ron and the IWA about, you know, here, here are the ways that people define some of these relationships they have with each other oh, they need to trigger something from their enterprise system or they need a third-party data source to tell them the price of an asset or the location of an asset or, or any number of other things about the external world for the system to operate properly, um, that's where you, you, you have to have something that enables that connectivity but enables it at a level of security that is at the same level as the contract. I guess I wanted to uh, kind of pull out something, uh, Sergey, that you mentioned, you, and you kind of mentioned a couple times, the importance of standards, and maybe kick it back over to Ron. How do you think about standards, and not just standards, but the certification of standards? Where does this fit into the maturation of this space as a whole? If we don't have a way to build trust globally through to the regulators and to companies who are unsure about what this is supposed to be doing, let alone feeling like they have to use with one technology provider. You, in all my experience in the many different businesses that I, I've been involved in, the model that's been proven for decades is to have one unifying body that writes specifications that are business and market driven uh, specifications performance metrics without identifying the underlying technology to be incorporated. And then you have a third party auditing body uh, in the world, you have the big four. In our world, we will have a, a certification auditing body, which is another company, and actually we work with the company, uh, DECRA, they're, our, they're our certification party. They're, the, these guys are world-class experts in doing so. And so we'll be building through DECRA because we can't, we don't want to certify and we don't want to know what these solutions are. The companies will engage with a third party lab these guys, uh, and then they will go through some testing to validate the formula, how they're defining the use case for the parameters, the behaviors um, that go into uh, the, the token and the contracts that Chainlink is fo focused on, and also the analytics in one simple way such that you don't have to be a hardcore programmer to understand it. You can then uh, have the tooling that we also will provide so that it can connect to uh, any source of uh, any vendor who would like to, let's say, 
uh, respond to an RFP that requires that the solution must be uh, approved and certified by the IWA. This is how the world works. I guess, Sergey, first a uh, specific, and then maybe we can expand out to more general. How is Chainlink providing specific Oracle solutions for enterprises? Where, where is that taking place? And then I guess kind of more broadly or, or zooming out from your experiences with that, do you think that we're going to see enterprises become more decentralized? So I, I, I think in terms of enterprises, everybody from the enterprise side and from the, from the public blockchain side is actually going towards the same middle. Because what's, what's, what's going to be happening is the enterprises are going to need to meet the requirements of security and decentralization that the public blockchain people are building for initially. And what, what you're really going to see is you're going to see people build some kind of private or consortium environment that, that grows to a size where it starts to have to become more public. And then it'll have to meet more transparency and more decentralization requirements. And then you're going to see the public blockchain um, products move more towards wider adoption, but then they're going to hit they're, then they're going to hit up against all kinds of um, partly certification, partly various guarantees. Some of which they'll be able to do technically, some of which people will, will want other sets of guarantees. So I, I think that invariably everybody, just like everybody who does e-commerce or everybody does that does, does business before there was this idea of we're going to have all these internets. And we're going to all be sitting on our, our respective internets and doing business between our internets. And that hasn't exactly happened, right? Eventually, the people making the internet, they evolved it into something that could meet business needs. And then the people building internets, they evolved it out into something that can function in the internet. But they all, all kind of went towards one final middle shared global implementation, right? This is, this is, I think, the same thing that's going to happen here. And then just people are just approaching getting to that middle from different requirements. Right? The public blockchain people have requirements around decentralization and security because their goal is to go to production today. And the enterprises have requirements around privacy and uh, conforming to certain legal standards because that's the thing that drives a lot of their decision making. Um, but, but eventually, we're, we're all going to end up at a world where decentralization is the fundamental like transparency generating, the decentralization generating dynamic. What, 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 we, what we do in that dynamic is we work with, with large enterprises on the specifics of implementing their connection to contracts. So there's, there's just kind of stages, right? There, there are stages where people put value on these systems, then they define how they want to write the contracts around those value, those pieces of value, and then they want to connect with specific, um, specific systems. Examples of specific systems for us um, actually vary between two groups. They vary between data providers and enterprise systems. So data providers, you, you can see a lot of the data providers we, we send data from into the DeFi space. These are the same data providers that send data to the top financial institutions. And right now, that, those data providers power hundreds of millions of dollars in um, all kinds of financial products on chain. In, in other cases, we were able to go to firms like Google and other firms that have existing systems and we're able to wrap a chain link around those existing APIs to make them available and usable by developers in the enterprise and in public blockchain contexts. So the first thing that we do is, is we work with people to provide access to off-chain third-party data resources, in certain cases, computational resources um, like Google Cloud Functions, BigQuery, those types of things. In the, in the second place, we have integrations with enterprise systems, where the enterprise systems want to send a certain type of payment message. They want to send a certain type of uh, instruction. And that instruction is converted to a blockchain event. And then the Oracle can also interpret the blockchain events back into enterprise events. And that interpretation is equally important because it lets the enterprise system know that something happened. Super interesting. Well. I, we could dig way deeper into that, but unfortunately, we've reached the end of our time. So just quickly, by way of wrapping up uh, in, a, in a sentence or so, what gets each of you excited about enterprise adoption of smart contracts and blockchain coming in the next, call it six to 12 months? Ron, what do you think? I think that um, this whole notion of which you brought up, uh, decentralization, centralization, but it's all about a shared data infrastructure. 
And that is what, that's what organizations, it's co- companies, governments, nonprofits we're go- are going to be working on to fundamentally change the way in which they transact and share data. And, uh, and what we're experiencing is this massive change of how businesses are beginning to look at how they can open their minds up and look at business models and use cases that they never considered in the past. Sergey, take us home. Something exciting for the next six to 12 months. I mean, the, the issue for me is that I'm always excited and I'm always predicting that this <laughs> is the year. So every single year for me for like six years straight is the year. <laughs> I, I, I think the really the thing to think about is, you know, whether someone's a, an industry leader or a fast follower, I think there's a few people that are industry leaders that are doing some innovative work, but I think behind them, there are a lot more fast followers than people think. So people think that there's like this linear gradual progression of like one and then two and then three and then four and then five and then six, you know, people went live and it's all like every month, one of them goes live and there's some like magical slot that only one a month can go live and it's going to all happen gradually. And the, the people that have seen technological spaces evolve, that's not really how they evolve, right? You, you have somebody who's an industry leader, breakthrough, launch something, get on some earnings call, talk about how they made a bunch of profit from it. That's the first quarter. Then that following quarter, everybody's asking all of their competitors, uh, what is your plan for, for launching this category of product? And everybody knows that's coming and everybody's ready and everybody's saying, yes, we're, gonna, we're, we're, we're already getting it live. And so literally in two quarters, you have, you know, some guy making a move and everybody else lining up to, um, to do a fast follower maneuver. And, you know, who, who's, who's the wise, wise person there? Like, I, I, you know, that depends on the industry and things like that. But I, I think the, the exciting thing that I see is that there's more and more people that are ready to be a fast follower. So there's more and more people that are in a position where they have become ready. They have a blockchain team compared to three years ago, two years ago. They, they have some kind of middleware plans that they're discussing with us to integrate, to use blockchains. They have one or two blockchains picked out that they might want to do some kind of commerce on. And so I, I think the situation is, is, is very different, even though I say this every year, is very different from a few years ago where, where, where before you would have maybe one or two, not one or two, like four or five people all trying to be leaders. Now you have a certain still small group of people that say, I'm a leader. I'm going to launch something that's going to be a breakthrough for my industry in the financial products or the insurance industry or the trade finance industry. But right behind them, there's, there's a bunch of fast followers that are, that are not fully prepared, but they're moderately prepared to, within the space of a quarter or two quarters, launch a competing blockchain offering if they really had to, right? Like I know some of these banks and some of these asset managers, they have tens of people in some of these blockchain teams. That wasn't the case. And I, I think what, what is probably going to happen is somebody's going to launch something. They're going to make, make a successful offering out of it. And then there's going to be some serious fast following. And, and, and that's what you see with a lot of other things, right? You see that in technology all the time. I, I think it's going to be the same dynamic in our industry. And I, there's, there's people that are ready to do that fast following. So I think that's the exciting thing is that there's, there's a, an underappreciated large group of people that once the three or four leaders, technological leaders in their industry make a move and make a profitable result from that move, that, that there's people that, that want to follow that and are much more ready to do that than they, would, than they were even two years ago. Love it. Great uh, nuanced excitement, Sergey. Well, listen, guys, thank you so much for being here. Uh, really excited to see if, in fact, this is the year. And certainly, even if it isn't the year, uh, every month that goes on, there's more progress being made thanks to companies like yours. So thanks so much for sharing your insights.